it turns out that sustainable behavior, right? Actually, moderating your consumption uh, actually gets you more fish. And you can extend that to many things that you use for business, right? Um, there is a perfectly rational reason to overexploit. You know, everybody needs to feed their families, right? Make some money. Because no one is going to, you know, get they won't take love of country, right? In the in the market. They won't take that you're a nice person. They really want cash, right? Um, there is every reason to overexploit, but the data says that enlightened self-interest, which by the way, altruism is all that altruism is, enlightened self-interest will actually get you more fish. Okay? Often, the right economic decision is the right sustainable decision. You will actually be more profitable as a company, as an individual. You will actually have more if you behave sustainably. And everybody tends to say, like, well, you know, the Philippines or, you know, Burma or, uh, sorry, that's Myanmar. You know, we're, too, uh, we're, we're a small country. We need to pull you to grow. Or we're a small company. It has to be business as usual. Um, actually, the cost of that is really way too high. This is a massive business risk. I think seven out of ten jobs in developing countries are somehow based on the ocean. Okay, um, so an entire asset base is at stake. Sustainability is simply fishing like there is a tomorrow, not fishing like there's no tomorrow, right? So it actually isn't that hard. You know, you, if you look at global marine fish stocks, this is the latest data I found at 2012, 22% of the world's fish stocks are collapsed. That's what happened the first round, right? Everybody overconsumed. 36% are overfished. 32% are at the limit of sustainability. And 10% are recovering, at least, happily, due to sustainable fishing. Interestingly enough, when we use technologies from the four I R, or the fourth industrial revolution, you actually get to see um, where the fishing happens, right? So this is data that um, we use the track radio transmissions. These radio transmissions have to come out because they're what the boats use to avoid collisions. So they probably don't track illegal fishing. But you can see where the fishing really is. So there's the Philippines, right? There's Pacific Ocean. You can see where the salmon is getting fished, right? Um, all that caviar, probably not good to take the eggs, right? <coughs> and there are some holes here. And these holes are because these are vessels avoiding marine protected areas, right? So there is some progress. And yet, here in the Philippines, incidentally, we have more than 7,100 islands. That is so 20th, 20th century. We have 7,600. Okay. Um, but in an archipelago, we are actually importing fish. Why the heck are we importing fish? And yet, we are one of the top high seas fishing countries. Okay. We are clearly not managing our resources well, right? That's going to be a terrible problem because if you like eating champorado with fish, right? You're gonna lose fish. If you like sushi, there is no fish. If you watch that great documentary um, about the master craftsman, Jiro, Jiro dreams of sushi, there's actually a good, you know, one minute where he holds forth about sustainable fishing because he can't get the fish that he needs anymore to make the best sushi. Right? How old will you be in 2048? Jill, how old will you be in 2048? <laughs> uh, you decline to say. All right. It's okay. Age is mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. And I assure you, as a biologist, if you're if towards the end, you will have no mind, so it really doesn't matter. 
65. I'll be 70. And how old will you be? 59. 59. Okay. Guess who I'm calling? <laughs> yes. Bettina, how old will you be? 54. What is your life going to be like in 2048? Assuming that all of these trends continue. Well, there will be no more fish. Okay? Rice will be scarce and unhealthy in all of the ASEAN region due to carbon emissions. Why? Because, because of all the air pollution. For those of you who are new to Manila, right? Uh, we are famous for our Manila Bay sunset. You know why? Because of air pollution. Any physicist will tell you, you will not get that beautiful light spectrum without chemicals, right? <laughs> in the air. No one now progresses like that, right? Except because of the air pollution. And because of that, if you remember your fifth grade, right? All of this goes back to the earth, right? On one hand, this is a good thing. This is the reason we were never affected by SARS or any <coughs> epidemic, thank God, because that bacteria came to the Philippines to one look at our existing bacteria and said, please don't punch me in the face. <laughs> I'll just go back to Hong Kong. Please just don't hurt me. Right? But for the rice, what's going to happen? The rice and most of the other crops, actually. I'm just saying rice because most Filipinos eat everything with rice. Right? So what's going to happen? You're going to lose, you're going to have iron deficiency, you're going to lose protein, and you're going to lose zinc. All of that is going to affect your immune system, so you will be more susceptible to malaria and other infectious diseases, which, by the way, we have tons of in the Philippines. Right? Reefs will be dying along with 80% of the oxygen we breathe. 80% of our oxygen today that we are breathing right at this very moment does not come from the land. It comes from the sea. Wars will be fought over potable water because we won't have enough of it because of our, um, our population growth. And you and your family will be a climate refugee. It will be a completely different kind of refugee because we simply will not have enough in the planet. Also because the Philippines will be underwater because probably the glaciers will melt and we're at sea level. Unfortunately, no one will help you because empathy will have degraded in humanity. And if you don't believe that, you should go on social media and talk either about religion or politics. Right? And then suddenly, all these people you don't know will just feel the need to be nasty to you. Okay? So, on the empathy thing, you're just going to be bird boxed, right? Because actually, those blinders, the, the monster in bird box that I'm talking about in 2048 is one of our own creation, right? Our entire way of life will change. Fortunately, it's not that bad. Every day, in every way, it's getting better and better. And as clearly the other the, the three fisher folk that I called know, because they do remember who the Beatles are, thank God. I'm not the only person here. Um, that is a John Lennon song. One third of the world's new vegetation has been planted in India and China. Okay, seaweed. Um, which we have a lot of, by the way, here in the Philippines. It's Indonesia's answer to the global plastic crisis because they're going to start making packaging from sea, which will, of course, biodegrade. <coughs> There's a huge increase in marine protected areas, uh, even more than the, uh, than the holes you saw in the first graph. Okay? Um, and we are happy to say that there are more, there's, there's a comeback for some whale and shark species. Right, which were either overfish, because the food chain is complicated. You overfish one species, right, then the other predators. It's, it's all pretty linked and complicated. And here in the Philippines, we have a um, interesting form of mariculture, which is the coral farm um, in Mindoro. And this is great because that's more money and more oxygen for the rest of us, right? More money for them, certainly, and the community. Um, that's doing the coral farming. Um, the acquired coral market alone is estimated at uh, 12 million US dollars. And if we genetically modify the corals for acidity, because it's the thing that's killing the corals is basically the warming of the ocean and the fact that corals are, um, the sea is becoming more and more acidic, which is why when you go snorkeling now, um, you can see that the, uh, the corals are bleaching 
they're turning white. They're not as colorful anymore. But if you genetically modify the corals to tolerate that, which I don't think would be very controversial because we don't eat corals, um, it's estimated to be a new, uh, $500 million uh, per annum market in 2020. And we have the technology to do that. What can you do individually, right, for sustainability? Why well, go flexitarian? This is very hard for me. I am a devout carnivore. I never met a piece of pork I didn't like. And my assets have sort of been increasing since. Pretty much birth, right? But if you just adopt a few days of plant-based diets, um, you can, or intermittent fasting, or whatever it is the new thing, probably not keto because you have to eat meat, right? Um, that would actually, with, with the critical mass, um, decrease the impact, mitigate the impact of the things in 2048 by 50%. Um, and the other impact on um, the water and the uh, land by 25%. You could innovate, which is what you're here for, I guess, in agri-tech or ocean tech. Or at the very least, when you go home, talk about what you learned today. If you see something in social media, share it. Right? At the very least, if you don't have the money or you don't feel like innovating in agri-tech or ocean tech. You can, of course, compost, recycle, and avoid single-use plastics. There's more than enough straws that you can buy now, right? That you, so you don't have to... And besides, you know those paper straws at McDonald's, they're really useless. Yes. So why use them anyway? Uh, <coughs> and of course, for empathy, right? Because your empathy muscle is low. You have to stash your cell phone and be here now. I can assure you that when you die, no one is going to say, gee, I wish I had unlocked all that, those achievements on that app, or I wish I had gotten more Candy Crush levels. No one says that. <coughs> and sure, you could say, like, yeah, but what's that going to do? I'm only one person. Okay? But you know what? Alone, we are a drop, and together, we are an ocean. And for all the Filipinos in the room, there is alone and there is together. Right? <laughs> then explain to the foreigners later. I just wanted to make you laugh, right? Um, okay. And this is why, what do we learn from the simulation of the sustainable development? <coughs> Actually, what happened? Because the three of the fishermen, fisher folk, talk together, right? So individual action is probably not going to be the biggest driver of change. It's probably mutually aligning incentives, right? Um, and you have to do that by treaties and regulation, or basically mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon, which is what they did. Is there always an option for one of them to say, like, yeah, I'm only supposed to take one now, but you know, I'm kind of hungry, so I'm going to take two, right? Or there was a typhoon, and I'm going to take two. Right? There are many mitigations, so you can always violate the agreement. But that is what we call in economics the tragedy of the commons, which I'm not sure if Prof. Poch mentioned in his lecture. And if not, you can always Wikipedia it. Right? The tragedy of the commons is basically common spaces, like the huge swath of the ocean several slides ago, that are international waters. You know that place in Crazy Rich Asia where they had the bachelor party on the barge? Right? No country owns that, therefore no country polices it, and anybody can do anything, like have that crazy bachelor party on the barge, right? So in a way, that part of the ocean is the largest failed state, because no one polices it, and God knows what's happening over there, and how much that's being overfished, because there's no Coast Guard. I would argue that in the Philippines, the Coast Guard is also so underfunded, there's no Coast Guard here either, right? And we all know what's happening to our fish because we're importing some. <coughs> the thing is, resource security is the foundation of poverty eradication. Right? But stronger civic institutions are key to escaping the resource trap. This is another concept in economics called the resource curse. And the resource curse is about how come the countries that have the most natural resources tend to be poor, right? Why do they tend to be poor? And that's because, as my, as my uh, best friend who's a civil engineer says, people ruin everything. 
right? <coughs> and that's basically because we need stronger civic institutions. We actually need to bring people to the table. Even if they only talk for a short time. How long are conferences? Three days? But if you make the agreement and you keep it, they only had 10 minutes, they didn't crash the ecosystem, and they made tons of money, right? In the first round, everybody loses. In the second round, everybody wins. But I can always change that simulation. There's a phenomenon called bioaccumulation with all the plastics and microplastics in the ocean, right? That's going to cause chemicals. Those chemicals will be what we call bioaccumulated. They'll be more concentrated. This is why there's such a rash of breast cancer and all these things from the hormones that you have from factory farming of chicken, right? Because your hormones go haywire, right? And not just because it's the red tide. It's because, right, those, those those, those chickens are like Dolly Parton, right? They haven't seen their toes in like, since 1960, you know? Um, <clears throat> but I could say that, what's the, uh, the more fish you eat, how, how, often, how soon will you die? I can also say, right? I can also assign roles. Fisherman Jill is a, Jill, let's say Jill, who was nice enough to take in the first round, take an S fish. What if I say you are a developing country? You can only you only have the resources to do line fishing. You can't afford trawlers, and you know the nets. It's just there are too many typhoons. You can't net fish, right? Well, then I say okay, you're a middle class country. You can have one and two fish, right? The net fish or line fishing, and you you can just throw through the oceans because isn't that the way the world works? And if we crash the ecosystem, isn't it going to be the poorer countries that will suffer disproportionately? Or let's bring it home. If that lake is in Mindanao, and one of you is rich, and one of you is middle class, and one of you is poor, guess which family is going to die first? The poor one, right? That's a, it's very logical, and it's totally unfair. Climate change and all of this is going to disproportionately affect the poor. And part of the reason sometimes they're poor is because, again, as my best friend says, human, humans ruin everything. Okay? We need stronger civic institutions to, ex to escape the resource curse. And so if we consume less and we slow down population growth, which is also vital, that's great. But you know the best way to do that, that all the research has proved, all the data says, is to empower women. So. Technically, all the sustainable development goals are intertwined, right? They're all, they all, how can you have no hunger if you don't take care of life below water and life on land and protect the planet? How can you have empathy if you don't have reduced inequalities, quality education, gender equality, peace and justice? How can you have good jobs and economic growth if half the human race is, you know, discriminated against. <coughs> Which half I'm going to talk about later, right? How can, how can you do that when, you know, you have clean energy? You, we're going to have a water shortage. So maybe we should have desalination plants. But if we have the desalination plant, we're going to need to power that, right? How are we going to power that? They're all intertwined. And this is why when people read news about the environment and they think about sustainability, everybody gets depressed. Right? It's like this complicated problem. It's almost like your love life. Right? You have all these little problems that you sort of put together and then drop into your lap and then all you can do is cry. <laughs> okay, the people who laugh, they're like me. Okay. I'm glad the rest of you are happy. Before I'm just it. Right? <clears throat> That's okay. Push me in. So, <laughs> climate change is not the problem. Water shortages, overgrazing, erosion, desertification, and the rapid extinction of species is not the problem. Deforestation, reduced cropland productivity, and the collapse of fisheries is not the problem. Overpopulation is not the problem. Each of these crises, though alarming, is a simple is a symptom of a single overriding disease. Okay? Humanity is simply demanding more than the Earth can provide. By focusing on this core dilemma, we can drive actions, address all the symptoms, and avoid solving one problem at the cost of another. 
And this is why we need a strategy for it. Okay? What happened in the second round? You, the fisher folk got more information. How much initial resources were there? How quickly do they grow? Right? What is the maximum capacity of our current environment? Based just on three pieces of data, right? They were able to actually not just save the planet, but save themselves. And by the way, I really don't like the narrative of save the earth, save the earth, save the earth. I can assure you, on my honor as a biologist, I have no honor as a professor, which you will soon find as I teach you some more, right? But on my honor as a biologist, the earth will shrug us off like a bad cold. It's not about saving the earth. It's about saving the humans, right? The problem is we only like to save things that are cute. Everybody wants to save the dolphin. Why? We all have an uncle that looks like a dolphin. He's bald, he chatters a lot, right? He's got a goofy grin. Nobody wants to save the snake, right? Nobody wants to save the bee. They're like, yeah, get okay. it, right? <laughs> there is only one thing that I, I, I can assure you that you can terminate with extreme prejudice, and that is a cockroach. This is a species-to-species -species battle. Okay? There is only one race, and that is the human race. I take it incredibly seriously that they will survive, and we will not. You kill them with extreme prejudice. Right? And the only place I tell you, it doesn't matter what color you are, what religion you are, who you love, it doesn't matter because all of us are incredible cowards when the, when the cockroach starts flying. <laughs> right? We are all equal in fear. Right? Because no one is brave when the cockroach starts flying. Right? I'm telling you, right? Uh, like, the, the, the strongest people, like Wolverine, would scream like a girl. Right? Ah! <laughs> oh my god! It's a my cockroach! Right? So. <clears throat> But when you know, right, resource pressures, right, you know that the trend is resource pressures are increasing and our populations are expanding. So countries are competing with one another in an auction for the Earth's limited biocapacity. Sound resource management means building wealth and preserving assets rather than liquidating them to boost GDP. You know what GDP is, you guys? Okay, do you know You know it stands for Gross Domestic Product, but who can tell me how that works? Okay, so it's really... Jordan, yes, Jordan, how does that work? Uh, it's, it's a measure of products that produce um, uh, uh, domestic value. No, I, I just Okay, right? <laughs> Sorry, that was... The, I'm, I'm blind from that flash of the obvious. Right. Now let me try again. So sure. Uh, so GDP would be uh, a measure of products that is produced um, in the country. Yeah. So, okay, I will give Lorraine a chance and then Carlos. Yes, Lorraine. The way we measure GDP is to get the sum of the consumer spending plus the investment of government spending plus the net of net by subtracting the exports. Oh, that is technically correct. Yes. Carlos, did you steal your answer? Kind of. But kind of. <laughs> I guess that's the summary of GDP is total economic growth, but it doesn't measure all factors such as like sustainability or how happy people are. So it's not a complete measure. That is very true. From a very practical perspective, I know Ed, but you already had so much CP time. Seriously, <laughs> <laughs> overexposed kind of. Relax, relax. I just want to share my problem. <laughs> You want to share your prof? Yeah, I mean, Where are you hiding him or her? Share what my prof said before. Okay. It stands for, if you want to recall it, it stands for Gawaditos Pinas. Ah, Gawaditos made here in the Philippines. Yes. Okay. So, I will, I know, Mikey, you were raising your hand, so what are you going to say? Well, uh, GDP only measures production, but it doesn't necessarily measure the other things like area. So, basically, anytime money changes hands, that contributes to GDP. That's the quick way to explain it to someone who doesn't understand what GDP is. And who are these people who don't understand what GDP is? They are, they're probably more than people who, they're, they're probably more people who don't understand what GDP is 
than people who do understand what GDP is, right? So, just to echo what Carlos and Mikey said, right? What's wrong with the GDP as a metric for uh, just because we're also using it in the wrong way? But it's like that saying that if you re if if all you have is a hammer, everything you know <laughs> looks like a nail, right? It creates crime, separation of families, which is what we have in the Philippines because of our strategy of migration um, for economic growth. Our number one export is people. Um, natural disasters, all of that is economic gain. It ignores the non-market economy of households and communities. It treats depletion of natural capital as income, right? It increases with polluting activities and also with cleanup, so it's kind of weird. It takes no account of income distribution. And it ignores the drawbacks of living on foreign assets. And most importantly, if you were going to focus on no poverty, right? which is goal number one. Using GDP to measure poverty is like diagnosing someone's heart disease by checking the engine of their car, right? It doesn't, this is why a lot of people, especially in the villages, the barangay, the kampongs, they don't care about GDP because they don't feel it. You know what metric they would feel? Increase in average household income, right? But yes, all they feel is inflation. Well, all they feel is prices going up. They don't know what inflation actually is. But anytime there is inflation, they figure out that someone is doing something wrong. Right? So in the moral words of Hermione, this is totally barbaric. Not the metric by itself. It's just trying to use it for everything. Going back to the hammer metaphor, really. I, if I wanted you to build me a chair or saw, no, never mind, the chair is too complicated, to saw a piece of wood in two and you brought out a hammer, I'm going to another carpenter, right? <laughs> because that's that's barbaric. <clears throat> so energy, food security, and water, they're all linked. A solution for one will impact another. So again, I, I, I said I had the desalination plant, actually producing more food, um, or energy actually requires more water. So it's all linked. How countries solve this and other problems are, are going to determine their economic success. And every business, tracks its revenue and expenditure. With economic success ever more dependent on limited natural resources, we need an accounting system to understand the planet's budget, right? Nations and companies ignore the link between resource security and the bottom line at their own peril. The other thing we ignore at our own peril is the fact that our narrative for people who care about sustainability sucks. Because if you only take one thing away from this lecture, I want you to take away that you make more money being sustainable, right? You can learn that in 30 minutes, right? You make more money being sustainable. And there is data to provide that. And we have measures like ESG, which is Environmental Sustainability and Governance um, Metrics, which we then put for publicly listed companies and so you can pick which companies are sustainable, and you can choose to invest in them. Oh, sure, every business, everywhere around the world says, oh, you know, we have CSR because we want to give back. <coughs> well, how about we invest in companies that don't take away in the first place? A lot, of, a lot of people, as they get older, it's like, oh, you know, I want to leave a legacy. Well, how about you live a legacy? Right? How about you are the legacy? Why wait until you're old and, you know, at the, you know, pre-departure area. It, I think that's way too late. We really don't have, technically now, we only have 11 years <laughs> before the next events, right? Because things have gotten a bit worse. But the narrative has to be that you make more money, right? And that working within nature's budget builds a foundation for our future. If I, I really like it if you guys stop using the word climate change or ecology, or whatever. Stop using should. In fact, we should ban should. We should we should use the word want. I want a future with sushi. I want a future with chocolate, right? Because I personally would be a danger to all mankind without chocolate. And I specifically mean mankind, right? <laughs> Especially during, you know, the days of the red tide. <laughs> <laughs> 
totally a danger to mankind. Without chocolate, all of you are dead. <laughs> I'm so sorry, right? Um, and then, I get it, resource and population trends have tremendous in inertia, but they can be reversed. And that's what I mean by building a better future for all. You're just living life, your life in the means of one planet. Because literally, even if Elon Musk succeeds, we don't have enough time to ship off enough people and terraform them. All science fiction has taught us that. <laughs> right? <coughs> and partners from all levels of society are critical if we want to reverse current trends. We have to work with the smallholder partners. We have to work with the big um, companies as well. Everybody has to do their part. Right? Just like the simulation. If I actually made, you know, Jilly and Bettina and, and um, Ed three different um, companies. Yes, sir. I'm just curious to know what your opinion is because uh, there are some companies who encourage or to do CSR. Yes. And there are also some companies who do CSP, which means, I'm not sure if you, all of you are familiar with it, but CSP means greatly shared value, which is actually helping um, the people who fish. Not right. Just Giving people the fish. The fish, yes. So, would you encourage more companies to do more CSP or you know, just sticking with CSR? Is okay? I'm, I'm going to go with the, the, the deeply proven narrative of, of our guests in the back from the Purpose Business Initiative who, um, who do most of the sustainability in the, um, in the country and they're based in Hong Kong and they do a lot of work around the world, which is that everybody should be doing something. <laughs> Right? As long as it's material to your business. For example, if a bank decides to clean up Manila Bay or pick up sachets on the beach or something, that's not actually material to your business. That's a one-time thing. Going paperless, that's material to your business. Right? If you're an IT company or you, you use a lot of servers, you know, you I I think I think if you lower the it raise or lower the temper, temperature crazy. You can pay everybody's bonus, right? Because things just get more efficient. It's usually not a change that you're totally going to feel. Um, in the same way that what really is the difference between one fish and two fish, right? So one fish you stew, right? The other, the other is you can just have like baked salmon or something, you know. Um, you're not going to feel it. You might feel zero fish, especially if we extend that to meat, because I would feel it if I couldn't eat pork. Everyone else would feel it if I couldn't eat pork. <laughs> right? <coughs> so, um, the world actually is not going to be divided by the ideologies of left and right anymore, but by those who accept ecological limits and those who don't. And the problem is, we have to care about the people who don't believe in climate change, who don't believe that the planet has limits. You can call it whatever you want. People have been talking about this seriously since the 1960s. There was this guy called Marvin Gaye who sang, Mercy, Mercy Me. Okay? You know, yeah, there are so many, like, okay, so some of you are millennials, fine, heal the world, right? <laughs> By the late Michael Jackson. Okay, whichever song you prefer. We have been singing about this since people could make music. Even the Philippine National Anthem. We are the one national anthem that talks about the poetry and beauty in our azure skies. Right? In the seas and our mountains and in our beloved freedom. That is the technical, it's not very singable, but that is the English of our national anthem. Okay? <coughs> And incidentally, our national anthem, the title is what? In, in English, our chosen land. So you have to choose. It's about choice, right? So, what has happened, at least in the Philippines, this is the data I have, I don't have data in any other country um, on hand. Our ecological footprint, because we have been growing so rapidly, has increased by three times. Okay? That is our ecological expense. Our ecological supply is about 0.6 global hectares per day. That is about 300 calories. That is a burger McDo. That's not even a cheeseburger. That is a burger McDo. A plain burger per person per day. Obviously, 
all of us, including me, eat a lot more than a burger McDo a day. So we are living beyond our means. We are actually in debt. We are in ecological debt. The last time that our country had more supply than demand was in 1963. We are now at demanding twice two Philippines worth of resources. And you can see how that happens. If you look at the Inform Index for Risk Management, and that is a business risk, by the way. Right? We are the most exposed to natural hazards. But we are 6 out of 10 in ASEAN for coping capacity. And if you don't believe me, just wait. There will be a typhoon that will prove me right. Okay? And this is complete data that if we knew, we could make better decisions. And if we actually use this in our planning for municipality, we could make better decisions, right? Only we don't have the data. But guess what? Big data is this huge part of the fourth industrial revolution. So my thing is, why don't we talk about the opportunities instead of the costs of sustainability? Because every time you tell someone that sustainability is a cost, they're going, ooh, that sounds painful. I don't want to, right? Take, for example, my total reluctance to turn vegetarian, right? Part of it is because I'm a biologist. I, I wear the apex predator, we have fangs because we're supposed to bite into meat, right? And I always argue, I'm a vegetarian, I just like it processed, you know, but it eats the vegetables, I eat the thing. It's, it's kind of vegetarian. Chocolate is like a plant, right? I'm a vegetarian. But what's my problem? The problem my have with going vegetarian is because it tastes healthy. You make something that tastes like chicken karaage and it's like from tofu, I would eat that. You give me a choice, just don't make it, don't make it taste healthy. Right? One of the, that's one of the few things, you, can you make it taste good? Maybe not as, I don't know, loaded with MSG and all the preservatives, just, right? But maybe not so healthy that it's like lawnmower sweat. Because I'm sorry, I tried to eat grass, and it's just, I'm never going to do it again. <laughs> it was a unique experience, which is the polite way of saying I never want to repeat it. <laughs> so, in the Philippines, again, Philippine data, these are the opportunities. We have 98.54 billion cubic feet of natural gas reserves. What are the 38.5 billion barrels of oil reserves? 4,757 cubic meters per capita per year of renewable water resources and 13,097 megawatts untapped hydropower potential. Why can't we say, instead of like, oh, if the Philippine Eagle stop shooting him or her, right? That we are third in global terrestrial biodiversity and that is a $36 million per annum net present value. We are first globally for marine biodiversity and that's a net present value of $556 million. And the estimate is, if we harvest this sustainably, if we harvest this for the Filipino people and the world sustainably, that will increase by 72% per annum in perpetuity if we just weren't jerks, right? There is a way in stewardship of the planet to be sort of, I don't know, non rapey And part of the ways we can do that is the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution was all about steam. The second industrial revolution is all about electricity. The third industrial revolution is all about apps and computers and thank God video game consoles, right? But the fourth industrial revolution has several technologies, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, biotech, robotics, autonomous vehicles, nanotechnology, quantum computing, and the internet of things. And I'm going to slightly mention this one or the other about how this ties in with sustainability and with innovation. Why? Big data. Here's the problem with big data. We're drenched in facts. Right? But, you know, being factful is not being smart. It's not knowledge, nor is it wisdom. Just because I can Google something, right? Who was that guy in that movie that just because I can shazam something, even though I've totally misunderstood the lyrics, right? Even if I think the lyrics are, you know, even if actually shazam doesn't, you don't even need to know the lyrics. You can just go, 
considering your music nowadays. Na 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 na. And they're like, yeah, I know the song, right? It's One Direction, you guys. And, and Shazam will judge you, right? <coughs> We're going to drown in data unless we build a boat because we don't know what to do with it. We're drenched in facts. Three or two or three years ago, I had a student from the Masters of Development Management who was part of the police. And he said, actually, we don't use data in the government because it, it, it really just shows you problems you can't fix within one presidential administration. And I'm like... <laughs> And then this is when I think, yes, I should have really taken up meditation and yoga and all these things that would calm me down, Because right? I'm pretty sure punching a student in the face would like, you know, let me lose my job. But I, I, I succeeded. But I was just like, oh my gosh, this is why we're in the place that we're in, right? But here's the problem with all of these things, and especially big data, right? Technology is a revolution. Governance is an evolution. We don't know what to do with it. When the internet came out, no one knew it would destroy property rights. It would destroy intellectual property rights. Not anybody can steal anything from DeviantArt, from Google. You can just use this you know, thing. I always make sure right, that it's not copyright. <laughs> but even if not, I make sure that if it is, I, I am fair use because I'm using it for teaching. When I get paid for it, I don't. <coughs> you don't know how to govern things. right? And then the other thing is that no one will believe the data unless we learn, to, we learn how to govern it. So, you know, because there will be people in high places who will say they don't believe the sustainability data. What are you going to do when somebody says, I don't believe there are 20 fish in the pond? Yes. There must be 50 or 50,000, right? I don't believe that the growth rate is only 25%. I don't believe that the maximum capacity is. And part of this is the way that we have talked about things. What we should never have done, which we did in the last 10 years, is to ask people their opinion. If I suddenly said to the average person, do you believe four is greater than three? If I said it once, they'd be like, yeah, of course it is. <coughs> but if I said it a lot, they would go like, wait. You mean it's possible that it isn't? It's possible that my whole life is a lie? Don't ask them their opinion. It's a fact. It's a fact. Everybody has the right to their own opinions. This is a universal you know, human right. No one has the right to their own facts. Right? Now the only thing that everybody believes in is gravity. Because it's not a theory. It's a law. And if you don't believe in it, I throw you off the building. Before you land, you will believe in gravity. Right? <laughs> Nowhere is this more prevalent than fake news. This is a problem everywhere. The problem is that fake news is an umbrella term. We are conflating bias with fabrication. Do I, are all newspapers or journal outlets or blogs biased? Of course they are, right? I'm biased, right? Ari's been my best friend for 14 years. I think he's a wonderful person. I'm biased. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm wrong, right? <clears throat> my mother, of course, thinks I'm a genius, like her. She's incredibly biased, but she's wrong, right? So, so you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, what does bias matter? This is why you don't only read one thing, right? What the... The other part of fake news is that it's fabricated, right? So there's there's disinformation or misinformation. Misinformation can just be satire, like the onion, right? Um, but then there can be misleading content or is fostered. Then other deep fakes, and I'm like, you guys, what is the problem? I'll tell you what the problem is. Ninety percent of the data that we consume today was created in the last two years. Do you know what that? Do you know how much how much the volume of data there is on the internet, right? And so when I talk about governance, who is supposed to validate the data? The people who collect the data? People at data science upstairs in the same school as you, right? Is it the person who curates the data? Is it the person who communicates the data? Is it the consumer? Because if it's the consumer, it sucks. The cognitive load is unbearable. Because just to get a proper understanding of something, you have to read three or four just to get the nuance. 
And I'm pretty sure I'm like the only idiot who does that left in the world. The other thing is that the news, um, the news business model has changed. Before you used to have subscribers. This is why the Washington Post could post, could could write about that expose um, with um, Watergate, right? Uh, this is why they could, the New York Times could write about the Vietnam War because they weren't loyal to the people who paid for their ads. They were loyal to the people who paid their salaries. Those people were the subscribers. Now no one wants to pay for news. And you know what? Real investigative journalism, unbiased journalism, it costs money. But now we don't value, right? This is human nature. We don't value what we get for free. The moment, however, the things that you that we're used to getting for free, the moment you charge even one peso for it, we're 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 upset. Right? Imagine if McDonald's charged you, I don't know, even one cent pavo for the ketchup packet. Wouldn't we all rally outside, right? And I could see so much money you're just gonna charge me for ketchup. Right? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> right? Yeah. Or KFC would charge you for like the first gravy. <laughs> like okay, that that I you know, twenty-six other gravies that I buy. Sure, but the first gravy, what's wrong? What's wrong? What? what you can't pay your bills, huh? huh? Okay. You know what? They, 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 they're gonna shut the lights off on you. What's wrong with you? I'm never eating here again. Why? Because we used to get that for free. That's a problem when you get things for free. You don't value it. You don't esteem it because you got it too cheaply. And that's what we expect now. We want our music to be free, right? And stream. We don't want our YouTube to buffer, right? As we pronounce it in the Philippines because we put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, right? <laughs> so, we don't want to do that. And yet, convincing people of what is really true, there are not flat earthers. And like, seriously? Seriously? We've, we've not just gone back to the Renaissance. We've gone back to, to like, oh my God, when was the last time people thought the world was flat? The time of like, Columbus. Right? In 1492, you know, just coming out of the Dark Ages. What's wrong with that? You know, so, and some research, you can't see it, but it says most researchers um, will try to engage, and this is from Nature, which is a premier scientific journal, so will try to engage online with informed journalists and pseudoscientists will be familiar with, what's his name? Bradley, yeah, which is the, the, uh, the, the it's, it's not actually, it's the law of bullshit asymmetry. The amount of energy necessary to refute bullshit is an order, order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. And this is true of empathy also. It is so easy to be a jerk. It's so easy to be an asshole. It's so easy to break things down. Building things takes more work. Destroying things is very easy. Every child knows this because you build a sand castle and then your older brother or sister walks through it, right? It's very easy to destroy something. It is the easiest thing, okay? And what does fake news do, either through bias or fabrication, right? It actually affects everybody, right? Some of you may know the recent thing, but uh, with Maria Ressa. Whether you like her or not, whether you like Rappler or not, whether you, you know, you, you're for the president or against the president, don't care about the president, just want to avoid the president. You know what? Facts don't care about your feelings. And the fact is, most rich people who could invest in our country read Forbes magazine, right? And then Forbes magazine comes out with this article that says, lack of governance leads to the institution, which is bad for everyone. How can you disagree? Right? You can publish anything in a local newspaper, anything in a local blog, but you know what? People who are rich read Forbes. And that's going to be a problem. And whether you think it's true or not, whether you agree with Rappler or not, you know what? I, I don't agree with Rappler a lot, but I don't need to. First of all, I'm secure in my own opinions, and my, I don't need it to be validated. And besides, I read Blackler, and I read Empire, and I read the New York Times, and I also read the Wall Street Journal, right? Because you want to have two sides of the point. You want, if you want to know actually the truth, instead of just validating your ideas, that would be cool, right? The other thing is we've lost the way to, we don't, where our narrative is losing, you know? Because anything can be fake news now. And it's the way we present it. This is an article from the World Economic Forum. 
without concerted action, we estimate that we estimated that environmental pressure of the roof of the road to similarize the westernization of diet. It's a word salad. Who, who's got time to read this? Everybody has a tiny attention span when it comes to reading. Otherwise, you spend like an hour on an app, right? <laughs> like a game or something. You can, you can spend two hours watching YouTube videos or Netflix, but your attention span for reading, tiny, right? So this, this is a fact. Facts don't convince people, okay? This might convince people, right? Before your seduction, think footprint reduction. And how are we going to reduce the burden on the planet if there's so many of us, right? And what I say in the Philippines, because this is rather controversial, is that if you are a good Catholic and refuse to use contraception, then invest in climate action. I have no problem with you. Freedom of religion, of course. Just put your money where your mouth is. You refuse to, you know, control the spending, right? You might as well invest in increasing the resource. It works that way, right? You want to have 23 children? That's fine. That's not an exaggeration. Ramon Rodriguez Sr. has 35 acknowledged children and 85 unacknowledged children total, right? <laughs> the fact that he is neither burdened with education or class or, you know, any good virtue and that stupid rocks evolved from him is quite a tragedy because he has, he has spawned 85 people, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> And the thing is, if you go from there, you know, it's more negative news. You know what? Consistent negative news that is not solution-focused creates learned helplessness. Learned helplessness feel is the feeling that no matter what you do, nothing will change. Right? No matter what you do, nothing will change. What does it matter? What does it, you know, and this is very much why the Philippines are the, the Fili Filipinos are the teenagers of the world. We have freedoms, we have views and responsibilities we refuse to shoulder, right? Everybody says they want order, right? But I see all the people who say they want good order and like a, a functioning society, and they all jaywalk to Greenbelt, right? Two minutes after talking with me about order and, you know, <laughs> mitigated license in this country, they jaywalk and they're like, well, maybe the change should start with you, right? Maybe you should, you know, not just practice what you preach, maybe you should preach what you practice, right? Like, you know, I want order except when it's inconvenient to me. Oh no, you couldn't do that because it makes you look like a jerk. Well, maybe I think that you are a jerk, right? That's what teenagers do, and then they learn, and then they grow into semi-functioning adults, or they at least learn to fake it like all of us have, right? Another way of making a narrative is to say, the Philippines is a big ocean state. Like, we're a bit, I've never heard that. It's like, yes, did you know that 98% of our country is water? It's just we have no respect for our natural resources in the water. We're like, oh, we're an archipelago, we have 7,600 islands. I'm like, yes, that's great. But we're not Russia. We have a Department of Agriculture, but we don't have a Department of Marine Resources. We have a, like a tiny sub department in BOSD and a tiny sub department in BA. But we're 98% water. This is an actual picture of the Philippine fish. Right. It's awesome. And very few people have asked that now, but I'm so happy that a Pinoy team with isda, isda is the word for, uh, the word for fish, uh, won the 2018 NASA Space Apps Challenge. So that's really cool. And basically, the isda app tells fisher folk um, about the weather and where it's safe to fish, right? And that would be really cool because a lot of people die. <laughs> so, another thing about big data is not to act on the data unless we build empathy and stronger institutions. Right? Because this is exactly what the lack of empathy is. I'm sure glad that the hole isn't at our end. I'm like, well, you know, in the immortal words of the dawn, we are all in one boat. <laughs> Seriously, the problems were all rowing in different directions, so we're not moving. <coughs> And why is empathy important? Why is the UK and Australia actually appointed ministers of loneliness? We've never before been more connected to each other, but we have terrible relationships, which is the number one predictor of a long and happy life. You, you know, later in the year, you, it will be November 1, All Saints Day, where all the Filipinos go to visit the dead, because our philosophy is visit the dead or the dead will visit you, right? So we visit the dead. 
right? And if you look at all the tombstones, it always says a beloved mother, loving father, you know, it's always about who you were to someone else. I mean, we're human beings, we're not human doings. And contrary to all the West's training, and that, you know what man's training is when a man sort of talks over a woman and then tries to explain something the woman actually already knows. Well, that happens to us in Asia when people from the West who come here and they West explain, right? <coughs> Contrary to all the West explaining, what we feel is deeply important to how we perform at work. In fact, kakwa, which is the core part of Filipino psychology, kakwa is the shared inner self. This is why in our language we have no word for hello. Right? What does a Filipino do when we see each other? <laughs> uh, the next thing we say is, have you eaten? Right? <laughs> have you eaten? Right? And then, and then we start asking impertinent questions. San ka galing? Where'd you come from? What did you do? What did you do there? Who were you with? Oh my God, back up! Right? Back up, leech boy. Uh, no, you know why? Because Filipinos know each other through metaphor. Right? We know each other through story. Always we try to share in ourselves with other people. That's why no business meeting comes without food. Because if you're going to be talking for a long time, there might as well be food. Which is why the favorite way of death in Makati is death by meeting. Right? Either from the food or from the length of it. But that is the core of Philippine psychology. So it does matter how we feel. Right? Particularly the poor. Because if they don't feel the economic progress, they're probably going to end up voting for demagogues. And that's true of Wolverhampton in the UK voting for Brexit, right? Paducah, Kentucky voting for Trump, or Kigapawan in Mindanao voting for the current head of state, right? <coughs> so it turns out your mom was right. Because if you look at the empathy index, which is a great use of big data, the top 10 companies in the country, 16 global empathy index, increased in value more than twice as much as the bottom 10. They made more money because they were jerks. Imagine that they were nice. You know why? Because nice people tend to hire other nice people. And they actually stay in their jobs because no one leaves the job for the company. They leave the job because of the manager. Right? And if brilliant jerks are tolerated, I mean, it's not going to work, right? So they actually generate 50% more revenue. And correlation, not causation, as high as 80% between departments with higher empathy and those with high performers. Right? A lot of those companies are tech, that's Facebook, Alphabet, which is Google, LinkedIn, Netflix, but also some brick and mortar companies, Unilever turns out to be a great place to work. Um, Johnson & Johnson, right? um, Novartis, Tesla, probably because they interact with Elon Musk very much. right? Procter & Gamble, Intercontinental Hotels, they're all great, and they all make more money. It turns out all our moms were right, okay? And part of, I mean, how do you increase empathy? Well, part of having increased empathy is when you have gender equality. Empathy affects profits, and including with women increases empathy. Um, I was looking at womenomics, but they didn't have the actual percentage, but there's the GDP increase if if that's projected, if it's gender equal in the UK, Japan, India, China, and the Philippines. Ah, sorry, and globally. What about the Philippines? The Philippines has been gender equal despite the best efforts of the conquistadors. For generations, women have fought with men and those who did not act as spies, right? Or provided aid. Um, <coughs> but we have always fought and died beside our men in every revolution either as spies or funding the revolution because how do you think all these Filipinos were going to eat, right? <clears throat> so, we have actually closed 80% of our gender pay gap and we lead Asia in SDG 5, which is gender equality. So, of course, the natural question anybody else asks me is, where is the money if we're so gender equal? So, there are two separate answers to that. One is we're not. Gender equality is more than pay and inclusion. It really is. And it's still really bad in rural areas. How do, what's the proof that gender equality, we're not gender equal, although we have closed the gender pay gap? The age of consent in this country is still 12. You know what that means? If you have children, 
and something untoward, horrible happens to them, right? It's all consensual after they're 12. Okay? Also, mandatory maternity leave just got approved yesterday, right? It's 2019. Why did we only approve it yesterday? Oh my gosh, right? So, we're not gender equal. And two, which is the less popular thing, because I'm very controversial with feminists, is that we cannot have gender equality without liberating men in this country. Until it is socially acceptable for men to be the primary caregivers, and we do not discriminate against them in custody cases, we will never be equal. Right? It is more socially imprisoning to be a man in urban Philippines than it is to be a woman. I can wear anything I like, right? And yet, I can expect a man to open the door for me, right? And pay for a date, and so on and so forth. So, basically, we're abusing them. We're not gender equal, right? Why are we calling it maternity leave? This is 2019, why don't we call it parental leave? There are two incomes. Who's to say that the man is making more than the woman? Shouldn't we give families the flexibility to take Leave either way. And when you call it parental leave, you honor fathers. They're not just sperm donors. Children need fathers. Right? Why don't we let men cry? Why don't we let them? And then why is it always in drama? Drama kasi. It's like, why, why are you crying? Are you gay? And I don't know why gay is equated with weak. Right? Because I know some really, really strong gay people. And I'd be afraid if I were you. But okay. We're not, we don't, we're not gender equal. And maybe it's, maybe it's a little, oh, it's a little, it's a little excessive, to all these microaggressions and stuff. But still, if we want real gender equality, we have to be okay with men and women. It's not even, there's no equality in nature, there's just variety. How about we just treat each other, I don't know, like human beings, right? We don't make assumptions about each other. I'm a woman and I can't sew to save my life. I can somewhat cook, right? Um, but I can't sew to save my life. I'm also really bad at mechanical stuff. I recently discovered that you need more than one screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> but my roommate is totally, she totally can do all the toolbox things and whatever, change the fuse and whatnot. But she doesn't know how to shop. I have to teach her how to shop which is weird, right? But so what? Maybe there's no such thing as like normal. Maybe normal is weird. Maybe we should just take each other as we are. You know, like that air supply song. <laughs> which is, by the way, there is an International Men's Day, and that's November 19th. Yeah, because men, all of these statistics are from the US, okay? So let's move from big data and gender equality, and let's go to AI. AI, oh my God, it's gonna take all our jobs. Here's the problem with AI. We don't teach our children to run faster than a horse, right? We teach them to ride horses. So don't be afraid of AI, <laughs> because it matters how you use it, right? Trust me, did the internet take away a lot of jobs? Sure, but not every job. There's still going to be signs humans wanted, you know. <laughs> but also, there could be so many great ways we can use AI. One example is present now, and that would be IF triple T. If this, then that. It uses all the apps on my phone that can that that um, talk to each other. I don't know what the technical term is because I'm a biologist. I just use this stuff. But there are recipes that I can totally download, right? Like I can totally what is this? Text my location so I can send it to my friends. I can geofence the the school and like automatically send a text to my mother, I'm on my way home or something. Right? Create a new, I can create a new task when I receive a high priority email, so I never miss an email from that special some one. <coughs> I can add songs from videos I like on YouTube to, to a Spotify playlist. I can automatically mute my Android phone when I get back home. It's really great for lazy people. Plus it makes me look really thoughtful. I have, an, I have a recipe that automatically says thank you for following me on Twitter. And then people reply like I actually did it. People think I'm on Twitter all the time. It's AI. 
<laughs> but I look so thoughtful. <laughs> but you should use this, why not? Right? Um, it just keeps my apps talking to each other. You know, it's like the UN, I love it, and there's no complaints. So maybe we should think of AI as augmented imagination, right? You know, it's eventually some, you're going to have this, this situation where you're going to have the Internet of Things and the smoke alarm is going to go off and Google AdWords is going to send you an ad for a fire extinguisher and offer you temporary housing or maybe, you know, get a good deal on an Airbnb or something. And then you'll know that maybe your house burned down. I mean, I don't know if any of you watch Star Trek, but there's this cool thing where, like, computer. You know, play, you know, Janeway, play this, so and so. I think you could totally have like a, <clears throat> shall we say, boom chicka wow wow playlist, right? And you wouldn't have to, like, wait, wait, I just have to find that song. Who would say, what the egg shit, I'm stupid. Like, what is the thing that chicks like, right? You don't, you don't have to work. You could totally have that. Have a slow jam playlist. But yes, there is fear about the skills that people are going to, AI is going to take away our jobs. And this is the list of skill stability by industry. And jobs are being replaced. Um, in 2014, an algorithm got hired to, uh, uh, got appointed to a board of directors position in an investment firm, right? Because they could just analyze it. I wonder if they, he's regularly, can you say he or it for AI? But yeah, that algorithm got um, approved. Board, board of director. Um, and these are the top 10 skills and how that's going to change. It's still complex problem solving. But in 2020, it will be critical thinking, which is horrible for people with primary education. Because how can you think critically about something that you don't understand? So you'd have to have technological or scientific or civic literacy to understand something. So that's problematic. Creativity, people management. Basically, human stuff, right? So maybe this is why empathy will actually make you more money. <clears throat> so this is the, I'm going to give you a copy of the slides, by the way. And this is the skills change. <laughs> so stop taking pictures, it's fine, right? So this is the skills change from over, over time and whether they've gone up or down. And so you guys know what to expect. I mean, if you stay alive and we don't overfish ourselves to death, right? But again, this is going to be problematic for the Philippines because we have a explicit strategic direction of exporting people. 6,000 people leave a day. <coughs> they are our doctors. What made an extra year to become nurses. There are teachers, there are engineers, there are scientists. And more important even that, because it's not measured by GDP, they are fathers and our mothers, and our brothers, and our sisters, which is a commercial, I know. Um, so we tear apart families, and then we wonder why we have a drug problem, or a crime problem. Who's raising these children? Right? <coughs> and yet, you know, we refuse to invest in our own people. <laughs> okay. So there are three lies about the fourth industrial revolution. One is that learning coding and tech will secure your future. Actually, coding is probably a place where AI will take those jobs, um, except for the creative parts, not all the jobs. Two, jobs that require uh, EQ won't be eliminated. Some will, because I don't want human interaction for some things. Like, I don't, I don't really want to talk to my Uber driver. Seriously, I don't. I would actually prefer not to talk to the waiter, right? especially on Valentine's Day, or as I like to call it, Single Awareness Day, where they say, for one, and then they judge you. <laughs> and I just keep like saying, even if God is single. <laughs> you know. But that's okay, that's just me, I'm bitter. Um, so the question is, where do people value connecting with humans in a service context, right? So that's more important. Um, and if you become more creative, you should become more creative because AI won't, doesn't do creativity. Well, a lot of what sells culturally is a product of tropes, which is, you know, the, oh, you know, the best friend who dies, who has unrequited feelings, or, you know, every romantic comedy, there's all these. In fact, there's tvtropes.org, I think, or com, that you can see all the lists of all these, you know, cliches and stuff. 
And you know what? AI can do that. It's gonna, it's gonna get where AI can do that. So a better question is, do people actually want creativity? Who pays for creativity and how much? Because here in the Philippines, we apparently try to pay for it with mentions or shoutouts, right? Because you can totally buy, you can totally buy watercolor paper and paint with shoutouts. Please, you know, the Philippines is famous for its singers, its dancers, its artists, right? And we should pay them like craftsmen, not laborers. Please, 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 pay the appropriate amount for creative work. But it depends where creativity, right? Because there are some things I really don't ever want to do, and thank God for haiku. Because it takes me a long time to make presentations, I'd rather have a computer do it. And I'm so happy that I can now, I don't have to pick font choices, I can pick the font, I can totally, I can search, it adds the picture for me, it's so awesome, and then I could, I could like Zuru is coming out, and that's full AI, and I can just, I would just like to do stuff with my brain, you know. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the, there's a need for digital, you know, there's IQ, EQ, and now there's DQ. <laughs> digital quotient, right? <laughs> Sorry. So this is an article that appeared in the New York Post. It's a satire article, Limiting Your Child's Fire Time, a Guide for Concerned Paleolithic Parents. In the end, just remember that fire, like most innovations, is both a blessing and a curse. Sure, it's made our lives easier, our survival likelier, and will probably lead to the greatest evolutionary paradigm shift in human history. But it's also dangerous, destructive, and yes, possibly infested with demonic forces, like your smartphones. How are kids going to know how to survive in the industrial revolution if they don't actually use the smartphones, right? It's like people said that playing Dungeons and Dragons or playing video games would actually make me a serial killer. It didn't make me a serial killer, it made me a social path, right? Sometimes I look up from my 13 hours of my video game on the weekend, I look out the window and I'm like, I tried reality, the graphics weren't that great. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I'm not going to hurt anybody. I never want to leave my room. <laughs> and then, of course, the one thing that AI will never do is leadership. And the common misconception is that, well, there's too many leaders. No, there's not too many leaders. It's that there's no leadership. Leadership is it's not like the one person who drives a car or steers the boat. It's that if that person gets killed, a good captain, right, with a good team, the next person will take, will take control of the ship. How do I know? Look at Pirates of the Caribbean. Right? Jack Sparrow can steer the ship, but so can any of the other people. And if he, he's expendable, then he dies. Right? <coughs> Essentially, um, Professor Schwab um, actually says that we need leaders who are emotionally intelligent, who are able to you know, work together. They coach rather than command. They'll be driven by empathy and not ego. Right? And this is the future, whether you like it or else. Okay? Um, is this the, is it sound connected? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to show you a video about one of the cool technologies. So I'm happy, I'm very privileged to represent the country as a World Economic Forum here in Global Media. Um, and this is what the work of one of my friends, her name is Tan Le. She's from Australia, but originally from Vietnam, where she was Australian refugee. Um, she's literally inventing the force. Watch. Last month, I, I went to this, to this speedway in Brazil and I had this opportunity to, to drive a race car using my mind. The car, it doesn't have, doesn't have pedals, it doesn't have a, a, a steering wheel, it doesn't have anything. It's just him and his mind driving it forward. It blew my mind. It was very challenging to really concentrate and, and to, to feel that I, I was controlling the car. The team leader came to me and, and asked me, are you okay, Rodrigo, can we start? Suddenly it was me, the car, and the, and the track. I gave the, the first command, which was to accelerate, and the car started running. It was unbelievable. Yeah, I took a look on, on Top Link, yeah. and I saw your name. Right. So I, I thought, I have to find <laughs> Tanley, I have to find it. It was such an incredible moment for me too, to realize that a fellow YGL had used my technology, unbeknown to me at all, to do something so incredible. Tan Lee was sitting right beside me. I had no idea that she was the one who, who was responsible 
uh, for me to have this opportunity. This... I grew up loving Star Wars, so the idea of just moving an object with my mind is already the stuff of science fiction and the stuff of fantasy. That alone is cool. But driving a Formula One car, it takes it up to another level. Thank you, Tan Lee. Thanks to you, I am the first person on the planet uh, that has d uh, driven a Formula One car using thought. of the $5 trillion per year needed to meet the SDGs must be deployed in Asia-Pacific. That's more of a, that's not just a cost, it's also an opportunity as we saw from the fish game. If we look at goal number one, no poverty, Vietnam is at 3.2%, Malaysia is 0.3%, um, Thailand is at 0.1%, we're at 13.1%. So thank God for Laos and Indonesia, because otherwise we'd be bottom of the barrel, right? And we, honestly, you saw the natural resources slide. We have no right to be poor, right? And if you look at the rest of the SDGs, none of it is green. Not even gender equality, because there are different measures for that, right? We're not doing too well on the Sustainable Development Goals. Yes? Um, hi. Uh, yes. Just want to say... You don't have to stop. It's okay. Okay, we're not in high school, it's fine. Uh, I just want to say how I felt when I actually saw the gender equality goals. Because when I actually read all the goals, yeah. it only says women. I was actually expecting that it will be gender equality, meaning that it should be men, women, uh, LGBT. LGBTQI, I agree. So, my, I mean, this is just how I felt mm -hmm. when I read that we might be projecting that we're going to take care of the women and everything like that, and that we might eventually soon forget that we're not taking care of the men also. So how can this be? That's, that's well, I think on an individual basis, the first thing to do is, first of all, mentor somebody of a different gender. Number two, if you were a man, refuse to sit on a man. If you were a woman, refuse to sit on a man. It's statistically improbable that there is no woman who is qualified, right? And, you know what? Always push the narrative that it doesn't matter who you love, it's how you love them, right? Because honestly, nobody's marriage, like Ellen and Portia's marriage, has never affected mine. Seriously. I don't know any straight marriage that has been threatened. And I, I'm totally for marriage equality. Why should straight people be the only one to suffer? Right? Seriously. Like you want commitment and having to live with some stinky person for the rest of your life? Welcome to the club, right? And then this is what happened to my friend who once gay marriage was uh, legal in California. His mother called, like any Filipino mother, and said, "You can get married. You have to get married already, and then you should already adopt twins so that I can have two grandchildren. Because I cannot believe that you've been with this guy for how long, right? You should get married already. You can get married now." And he's like, what the heck? It just happened. I don't I don't necessarily want to marry this guy. I mean, I like him, but like, see, see? Now it's equal. I feel the pressure from a Filipino mother. This is what you wanted, right? Equality all oh, here. Here's the equality. Meanwhile, all the street people are going to sit back and like, yep. Been there, been that. <laughs> right? Then you're going to get, uh, when are you going to adopt a child? It's not even about fertility anymore. Right? When are you going to adopt a child? Because I can always say like, you know, when you stop being a busybody, right? So, back to sustainability because we're running out of time and I have another lecture and I want to, you know, give you some de-stress. The problem with the goals is that, you know, you can't actually say, and then a miracle occurs. <laughs> and then sometimes you're halfway through and then you're like, wait, maybe we should build the boat instead, right? That's the problem when you don't actually plan and you don't have a strategy, which is my next lecture, right? So I'm just going to talk about that quickly. One of the innovations that we can do for the goals is called impact investing. It's actually between philanthropy and financial investing. And that is the firm I just started last year. That is Ignite Impact. It's an impact investment. It's the first Philippine-focused impact investment firm. So we're dedicated to eradicating poverty. 
as measured by increasing average household income. This is the Philippines, this is the country statistics, and this is our startup ecosystem. Um, we're an investment grade country, we're the first, tenth fastest growing economy in the world, blah, blah, blah. This is from our pitch deck. But 9 out of 10 Filipinos have no consistent access to water or electricity. 8 out of 10 OFWs have no savings. 7 out of 10 Filipinos are ninjas, no income, no job, no assets, and therefore they don't have bank accounts. 6 out of 10 Filipinos die without ever seeing a doctor, have no valid ID, and have no access to the internet. Despite the fact that the average, that we are the we are a mobile first economy, one in three Filipinos have mobile phones. Why? Because the signal is so bad, right? Filipinos are the pop is the are the country that spend most time on the internet. Of course, because the internet is so slow, right? <laughs> it's amazing that we have 400 plus startups. Considering you know our course, do you know why justice is so slow? Because the internet doesn't work. You have to hand deliver all the documentation from one court to another. Right? So, 68% um, of those who are poor are farmers and fisher folk, I should change that. And when people say, well, you must have a bottom of the, are you going to invest in the bottom of the pyramid? We don't really have a bottom of the pyramid. We're like Shakira. We have hips that don't lie. <laughs> uh, at the top is from uh, like 7% of the rich and upper middle class. C minus, that's usually your call center workers. Um, nine, that's 90% of the country. 61% of the country is the political poor. Why do we call them the political poor? Because they have voters' IDs. And so the mayors and the politicians pay attention to them. 13% is the poorest of the poor. They have nothing. They're, they're far flung areas, right? In our oligarchy pedagogy. Far, far, far away. And so how are we going to how are we going to fix the Philippines? Sixty-five percent of our fish are from Mimaropa, right? That's Palawan, Romblon, um, Indoro, right? But there is an average of twenty-seven predatory middlemen. I have no problem with the legit middlemen. Okay? But there's twenty-seven predatory middlemen between us and the fishermen. Okay? They always put their lives on the line because they borrow money for boats. And then when a typhoon comes, or hit by 22 on average typhoons a year. The boat, they bar they can't, they know a typhoon's gonna come, so they borrow enough money just for a kind of like a, a boat that's good enough, right? And then they lose it, they have to borrow money again, and they're perpetually in debt. What are we going to do? By the way, for agriculture, they're 22, <laughs> I think, predatory middlemen between us and the farmer, right? So they're getting cents on the dollar. What are we going to do? You, someone has to fix this. And so our target portfolio companies, and this is stuff that I got from Davos. I, I launched the Ignite Impact Fund in Davos several weeks ago. The cool things are, of course, IT. But people are talking about agri-tech, ocean tech, ed tech, health tech, and civic tech. And I will talk about each of these things um, as we go along. So one of our target portfolio companies um, <coughs> is Quicksilver at on Ventures. It's the national broadband provider of the Philippines. Um, because again, the Philippines, um, the only country which has slower internet than us is Afghanistan. And we have the most expensive internet in Southeast Asia. So, instead of crawling fiber through an, an archipelago, which I could have told you was a really bad idea, but the duopoly is over leveraged in that, <coughs> We're going to use satellite internet. One node has a radius of 10 to 30 kilometers, which means that if you're here in the dorm and I put a node in Camp Crane or Camp Aguinaldo, all your Netflix will get faster. It will no longer buffer. You will at least get the speed that you're paying for. And like people who lay down the railroad tracks, I don't really care whose train goes on it as long as they pay me a fee. Right? Currently, as a national broadband provider, you, it's with the armed forces of the Philippines so that the SAF 44 thing will never happen again. They will have safe and secure internet and we'll just charge everybody else in that bridges for the internet. All the public schools and most of the state universities, all the post offices and CARD, the largest microfinance institute uh, 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 donor in, in the Philippines, they have twice the turnover of Metro Bank. And 7-Eleven, which is the fastest growing um, convenience store in the country. And so you would paper the country with internet. 
which is great. And totally sold it to the politicians, not realizing, because again, not overly burdened with education, that one of the things we would first do is have e-government, which would make it harder for them to be corrupt. Okay. How does this work for us? Every 10% of broadband penetration increases GDP by 1.1%. Every 1% increase in household income equals 3% reduction of the proportion of people below the poverty line. So it's a rising tide that will float all boats. Because you know what will take out the middlemen? You know what will prevent this when they dump so many, so many tomatoes? Why do they? Because DA focuses on production, and they've succeeded. Congratulations, Department of Agriculture. They didn't develop a market though, and the private sector is not invested in things like tomato processing plants for I don't know ketchup, which by the way we eat a lot of, right? Because we've never met a potato we didn't like, right? You need ketchup for fries, okay? Tomato, you know, a tomato processing plant is not rocket science. It's a very well established technology, right? And so, we would borrow something like e Chopal in India, right, which is even run by um, feature phones, which would give farmers accurate market information, help track crops and whatever, and you would just use a satellite to enable that and you would, you would never have this again. It's very simple. Um, for an example of things in the health tech space, um, this is another company by, run by my friend, um, Katie Stevenson. It's called Wheel Life. Real-life situations hit all of us, caring for aging parents, a cancer diagnosis, or helping a friend through a tough pregnancy or a neighbor after surgery. Loved ones want to help, but everyone is busy. They don't know how to help or even where to start. Dealing with a sudden or chronic health condition can be overwhelming. When the doctor's visit ends, real life begins. Wheel recognizes your trusted family or friends as a circle of support who just take care of things so you can heal and thrive. These personal relationships are essential to our health and happiness. So Wheel's easy to use mobile app connects the people in your circle of support to show they care in ways that are useful. Our fusion of unique task management tools and actionable gift registry and streamlined communication leaves you with more time for the most important things in life. The rest of the world has now experienced the joy of a four-generation family, something that we Asians have known all our lives. Right? When people ask why are there no serial killers in the Philippines, I say it's simple, you have no privacy. Right? You have to go to the States to become a serial killer and kill yourself. Seriously, just even that you have to go abroad to do. Right? <clears throat> so, on EdTech, we're, in, we're really hoping to invest in InvestEd, which is um, uh, incubated in the AIM Battle Nato Incubator. Um, it provides non-collateral student loans to Filipino students. They have a 100% repayment rate. They provide laptops, allowance, tuition. They pay directly to the laptop provider or directly to the school. They, there is a wall between the loaner and the the, the, the person, the student, so that, you know, no sexual favors are exchanged in repayment for the loan, right? It keeps, it, it keeps both parties honest. Um, <coughs> and they're, they're a great company. And more interestingly, 90% um, of the people, because they give them financial literacy and help them get jobs, 90% of the students were unbacked. And, and now they have bank accounts. So technically, this is the most efficient microfinance institution for, for getting financial inclusion. Um, and there's been up to 250% increase in average household income. Right? And it's not collateral. They use a proprietary metric. Um, they interview families. They, they, that's why they have such a good repayment rate. So we're hoping to invest in them. One of the other technologies we're investing in is Vital N. It's patented in the US. Um, the UAE, Australia, New Zealand, um, it's a biofertilizer. So instead of, so one box is good for one hectare and instead of the plant having six roots, it has 60 roots. Uh, good in a typhoon because it doesn't fall down. Good in a drought because it sucks up more nutrients. And the yield difference in corn is one metric ton per hectare. 
Um, so it is US patent and they have distributors in every region. So we're hoping to help that um, technology scale. That's Philippine technology with Philippine soil bacteria, which is hibernating in that box. Um, we're also going to put up the University of San Carlos in Cebu has the world's first mango waste biorefinery. So it uses the peel and the seed to make mango butter, which is yum yum, and also mango butter for beautification. Um, and the high value ingredients like uh, polyphenol and um, pectin. Pectin makes gummies gummy, and polyphenol is an antioxidant, so to keep you young. Right? They go from $600 to $1,200 um, per kilo wholesale. Right? Uh, and that's a lot of money for what is essentially trash. It's also great because it's a zero waste technology. And um, we're going to put that in Leo, where we're part, where University of San Carlos is partnering with Ayala Land and Ayala Foundation. So <clears throat> that's going to be really cool. I won't explain the whole thing anymore. Um, civic tech is on the rise in 2019. That was a big hit in Davos. Last year, Apolitical was launched. Apolitical is like LinkedIn slide share for, for policymakers, people who are, regardless of political party, that way you can get what has worked in Angola, what has worked in um, the UK, what might work in, you know, um, <coughs> and they get training and they learn now. So it actually increases citizenship and empathy in better civic institutions. For those of you who are architects, um, there's a lot of design for to decrease loneliness, right? Using alleyways, giving it better light, um, having gardens where you can in, in cemeteries so you can actually have the communal experience of maybe picking flowers and it promotes talking with other people. Um, this is just between condos, I think, for to, to decrease loneliness. So there's a lot of design going into that, but that's civic tech too. Um, and uh, as far as ocean tech is concerned, this is my interview with um, Nish Tegarin. He's uh, from Mauritius. He's a Ma he's a McKinsey guy, and uh, also a fellow alum from Cambridge University. Um, so Nish is the author of Soul of the Sea in the Age of the Algorithm, How Tech Startups Can Heal Our Oceans, which is really cool because the Philippines is a big ocean state. <laughs> so we're really excited about that. What's the three key takeaways for the Philippines from your book? Well, thank you. And uh, this is so exciting that we're here in the middle of the mountains talking about oceans. <laughs> um, so the book talks about the opportunity. We have a larger, we are in the middle of an industrial revolution. We are seeing technologies we never saw before, whether it's the growth of Facebook or WhatsApp or mobile phones. And in the next few years, we'll see things like autonomous self-driving cars, we'll have self-driving planes. But for a large ocean state like the Philippines or where I'm from, the island of Mauritius, we're now going to start seeing self-driving boats, autonomous vessels. We're going to see new ways that we can use the genetic resources of coral reefs for new forms of medicines. We're going to see technologies where we can generate energy from the ocean in ways we've never done before. So there'll be new sector, sectors of technology. And the really exciting thing is, most of the technologies over the next 30 years for the oceans have not been invented yet. So we are at the front of actually inventing new technologies and something like the Philippines can really benefit from that. Okay, cool. So what do you think are the opportunities for impact investment in ocean tech? I think there's a whole range when you look at what is it, what is it that the oceans give to, uh, to countries. Um, so in terms of impact, uh, the coastal communities are often the, the poorest in the world and they look at the ocean in, in several different ways. One is a source of food. So when we look at food from the ocean, there's some new impact areas about more sustainable seafood mm -hmm. where you can get a higher value for the fish if it's healthier. If there's less uh, heavy metals and less uh, toxins in the fish, can we get a higher price? Also, algae and new forms of using vegetables from the oceans as well. So that's a whole new field there. I think second, in terms of um, identifying new species, most of our species are actually 80% of biodiversity is in the ocean, and we've discovered less than 10%. So actually, how do we start discovering more and more about this, uh, the, the species? And some of this biodiversity, about 70% of all medicines have compounds that come from organic species. So something like the Philippines could actually, this could actually be a huge pharmacy for the world. And so there's impact investment opportunities there. And then on the digital side, a lot of the infrastructure to build this relies on strong internet connectivity, even amongst the oceans. So you have to explore opportunities 
is like satellite or drones and other forms of uh, connectivity when you're out on the, uh, on the oceans. All right, awesome. So you've also launched here at Davos the latest State of the Ocean Report. The 2019 edition. That's right. So, what are the key takeaways from that? Or should we be worried? Should we be optimistic? Yeah, so look, I'm sure in someone like the Philippines, we are facing challenges and we get the doom and gloom stories of, I'm sure, the coral reefs are degrading, the amount of fish catch is declining, we're losing mangroves, and that tends to be the doom and gloom story. And a lot of that is, is here, right? We, we talk about we have challenges, we're losing our coastal area. Some of it's climate change, some of it's pollution, whether it's plastics or agricultural runoff, some of it's overfishing. However, the thing about this report, it doesn't just talk about the problems, it talks about where some of the opportunities are. Not just solutions to say stop doing things, but where can we start using technology to actually build new opportunities. So in the last 12 months, we've discovered that there are new technologies that uh, involve new forms of aquaculture, new forms of energy in the ocean, even using seaweed to actually build new forms of plastic. You know, a company called Lollyware that builds uh, straws from plastic. And there's been some huge breakthroughs in terms of self-driving vessels, cleanups, environmental DNA, and even how we look at parts of the ocean which uh, don't currently receive a lot of attention. So all of this in the report doesn't just talk about the problems, it talks about the solutions. So for the Philippines, I think hopefully there's an optimistic area here, but we need more investment in order to scale up the impact so that Philippines can be part of the future as well. Thank you so much, Nish. Uh, it was really cold in Davos, so he lost his voice, and I really did too. Um, so, in the immortal words of the greatest showman, we can live in a world that we design. Right? Um, so, a couple of weeks ago, the World Economic Forum launched a meeting, uh, uh, a humanitarian investing initiative of which I now represent the Philippines for. So God uses clay vessels, God help me. I'm just faking my, you know, faking it till I make it, but wish me luck. And remember, there's nothing else that we should use, we should use the word love more, right? Because we love chocolate, we love, we love our lives. We want our children to be happier. And if we don't have children, Right? We don't want the cockroaches to take over. And we at least, even if you wanted to die broke, like at the 10th year, use up all the 20 fish. Right? That's only viable if you know when the world will end. Right? So, if you love your life and you love our lives, then, you know, we should probably, you know, do what we can now. You know, we should make a difference by being the difference. So, thank you very much. You have a 10 minute break, and then I will quickly go through the fundamentals of, yeah, of strategy.